unleavened bread that you can tear off yourself, or if you still you still don't want to touch the bread because I understand because of the COVID, we're not here to to make you feel aware that other the choice is yours. There's there's the bread and we can dip it in a cup or you can pick up one of these. Either one will be fine, whichever one you want to do. That's how we're going to do communion. And again, either way, it's totally up to you, and we're okay with it. Amen. So the Bible says, let's get this guy here. God is so good. All the time. All the time. God is good. God is good. There we go. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, it says, For that which I received of the Lord, for I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he prayed and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup, is a new testament of my blood. This to you is offered you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, the cup you shall show the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, that is not an adjective, it's an adverb. It's not talking about you two are all unworthy. Remember, we're all unworthy. It's talking about an attitude. Okay, if you got an attitude that I'm like the, the, you know, the publican and the Pharisee, you know, uh, I'm big and bad and I don't need anything, that's the kind of attitude. You got that kind of attitude, then, mm, okay. In other words, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, but let a man examine himself, and so that he eateth that bread and drinketh that cup, for he eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. But it calls me a weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For we would judge ourselves, but we should not be judged. Let's spend a few moments talking to God and just look. And, and I'll lead you in this prayer so you'll know how to pray. Y'all can follow me if you'd like, or you can pray the way you want. That's okay. But we're going to pray. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you, God, that although none of us are worthy of what Jesus did for us, he did it freely. And did it knowingly that we were not going to appreciate it when he did this. We thank you, God, that we don't worship our sacrifice. We worship his sacrifice. For he is a perfect sacrifice. And we thank you for it. <laughs> see the attitudes or any actions in my life that's not pleasing unto you. I ask you right now, Lord, to reveal them to me and help me to put them on the cross. Lord, we know, God, that we all stand to the same, same level at the foot of the cross. It's by Jesus Christ's blood and his blood alone. And we thank you for that. Ask you right now, Lord, to bless, to touch, to anoint in a very powerful way. And we thank you for what you're about to do for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, amen. amen and amen and amen. All right. Did, did, did I see Wayne come in? Did Wayne come in? Oh, I was talking. I was getting caught up here. I'm glad I didn't call I mean, y'all already know what happened anyway. <laughs> okay, bless his heart. I can't stand them things. All my choices, whatever, wherever I go. <laughs> all my guys, just all up to one time. Come on up here, man. There you are. Come on. There comes one. Now, he didn't know it. He had no idea I was going to do this to him. Come on up here, man. <laughs> we did this this year. We're just going to switch roles. That's all. Now remember, this is going to be open. So if you rather, if you don't, we're going to we're going to all we're going to wash ourselves up too. Okay, we're all nice and clean for y'all. <laughs> and if I see anything bad, clean that too. All right. So just to demonstrate, I'm going to show you. We have, we've already, we've already taken, partaken of it today before we, that's what the band does. Know that the band partakes of it before y'all ever get here, okay? But this is not let them breathe, you can pick this off and, and with grape juice, you can dip it into grape juice. 
I just you not dip your finger in it. Just put dip the bread in it, and that's safe. Just dip the bread, and, and you can take communion. And if you don't want to do it that way, then all we do the whole time with COVID is right here. So either way, we'll be fine. That's totally up to you. But what I want everybody to do is everybody stand. I want to start when this with row by row. Y'all just start coming up. Uh, start on this side, and when you get through, y'all come on up. And everybody can partake of communion. Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this communion. I thank you, God, for what you did. And I know, God, you got this. In the name of Jesus, we love you. And we praise your name. And we thank you for all that you do for us all the time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And Bob said he took the bread, he lifted it up, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said, Take it, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he said, This is the cup. In my, of my blood is a new covenant. I want you to drink it in remembrance of what I'm doing for you. So now, y'all come on up. Go on up how you want to do it. You want me to take care of it? No. Yeah. Oh, you want to go? That way? Never been This is his body. This is his body broken for Jesus. This is his body broken for you. This is his body. This is his body. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. His body broken for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his body broken for you. This is his body broken for you. Okay. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb of God. We thank you, God. Give Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, Lord. God is so good. All the time. God is good. You know, I, I, I'm amazed at, at how God handles things for us and how God puts things together for us. And uh, I wrote this down, but I might not, I put it right here. I put you read it because I forgot to put it up there. A man parked his bicycle near the Capitol of Washington, D.C. and walks home. A police officer stops him and asks, why do you park your bicycle here? Don't you know this is a VIP road and all congressmen and senators pass from here? The mayor replied, don't worry about it, sir. I like it. <laughs> you get it. They get it. <laughs> God is awesome. All right, handling your hurts. We were talking about Job. And so let's just all stand. And we're going to repeat Job 13 and 15. And that is, watch this. Though just say it with me. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Say it with me. Though he slay me, I will trust him. Him. So it's what your hands this way. Father, we love you, Lord. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We thank you, God, for all that you do for us, God. We thank you, Lord, for your power, your anointing. We thank you, God, that you know our need before we have it, and you have the answer. But the way you do things is you want us to realize our need also and realize that you're the one to take it to. And then you can do things for us. I ask you right now, Lord, minister, to move in a very powerful way. And we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said, amen. Amen, 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 amen. You can be seated. I'm going to sit down for a little while anyway. How about that?
Not sure how long, but I'll be here. I, 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 I just left. Remember, last week I was with preaching on the finished up on the book of Ruth, and the Lord really spoke to me hard and said and told me that that was not the right one for you last week to do Job. And Job was so full that I really couldn't do all of Job like I wanted to and give it justice. So I just started it last week. This is part two. So the first couple of slides are going to be from last week. But I promise you that's going to be it. We're going into something new. But for those who weren't here, it'll bring continuity. Now, now, now God's very powerful. God is all-knowing. God sees us from beginning to the end. The Bible tells us that He knows us that when we were in our mother's womb, He already had, listen, when we were in our mother's womb, He already had our life mapped out. He already had every day of our life already, already written in the book before we were ever born. That's powerful. Before we were ever born. Now think about this. So now, here we go. What do you do when you lie first? So, uh, a lot of times I'll find people that have committed suicide or non-suicidal injury or either just, just doing some, some crazy things. You know, but it's not that they want to hurt themselves, it's that they want the pain to stop. That's it. I want the pain to stop. And so because of that, our life, a lot of times people, when we see them acting kind of weird, or even seeing them jumping at somebody, or jumping down somebody's throat, or seeing all kinds of things happening, and wondering why is this going on? Why are they acting so weird? Sometimes it's not because they necessarily want to hurt you. It's that they want the pain to stop. And they don't know how to make it stop, and so many times in their, in their way of making it stop, they wind up hurting somebody else. So the question is, what do you do when life hurts? What do you do when you play by the rules? What do you do when uh, you've done everything they expected of you? You've lived a very responsible life. You've did everything. You've crossed every T. You've dotted every I. But still, the pain won't stop. Still, trouble comes. Still, the bottom just falls out and life just goes crazy. Well, we all get hurt in so many different ways. And so I just want to show you uh, just, just a few uh, of the ways that, that we do get hurt. Let me get here. I've got to get going again. Praise God. That thing, I thought I had it, I thought I had it all really good done. And guess what? I didn't do it. You see, sometimes we get... We get Sometimes we get so busy in life that while we're trying to do one thing, we do another thing. And I know y'all will never do that. We get hurt in so many ways. You know, maybe there's an illness. Maybe there's an injustice. Maybe we're criticized. Maybe we are highly critical of people. Maybe there's <coughs> adversity in our life. <coughs> there's loss in our life. <coughs> there's stress in our life. There's suffering in our life. And when this stuff starts happening, because we've done everything we can to make sure that we're right before God and we're right before people, then we can feel confused and disappointed. Have you ever felt disappointed with God? Have you ever felt disappointed with yourself? Have you ever felt disappointed in life itself? Because it didn't turn out the way you expected it. Right now, you're playing a hand that you think was dealt to you by somebody that dealt at the bottom of the deck. You feel like somebody had just, just give you a sucker punch. And so, Job felt that way, but yet he kept his faith, and though he suffered, through, suffered, he suffered with victory. And the Bible says, he said in Job 13 and 15, though he slay me, I will trust him. He didn't even understand that it wasn't God that was causing this pain. Although God could have stopped it, God wasn't the initial person that started this pain. We read it last week, so I won't go all into it this week because there's two whole chapters that I read last week. But we see that, that Satan was walking to the fro of the earth and, and he went before God to give an account of himself. And, and he said, he told the devil, he said, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, why? There's no need. You've got a hedge around him. Everything he does is protected. He's got everything. Everything's falling into place for him. Things going to give you better. He said, but I tell you what. I bet you he just serves you because you're so good to him. So if you just go ahead and move the hedge, he'll curse you to your face. And so God said, okay, go ahead. 
And so he cursed them. He didn't curse them, but he took the heads down. When he took the heads down, in one day, Job lost everything. The only thing he had left standing, he lost his children, his, his business, he lost his income, he lost everything in one day. And he still did not. He said, Naked I came from Mother's womb, naked I'm going to return. So the devil went, goes back before God and says, Well, I touched him. And he said, well, what happened? He said, he didn't curse you. He said, but let me touch his body and he ain't going to curse you. He says, well, go ahead. You just can't take his life. So he touched his body. And he had sores and he had to take a pot and break the pot apart and scrape the, the boils off his body. He had temperatures of 105 to 107. And still, he maintained his integrity. Now, I want you to remember something now. How did, and, and, there, and there's the verses, but how did Job handle his hurt? And what can we learn from him? I want y'all to say this with me. Here's his trial, and this may be yours today. It's not written up there. I need you to say this. God invited. God invited. Satan invested. Satan invested. And Job ingested. Job ingested. One more time. God invited. Satan invested. Satan invested. And Job ingested. Job in other words, God was the one that said, okay, go ahead and have that. <laughs> and so Satan invested in the attack and gave it all he had. And Job had to ingest this. He didn't understand because Job is the oldest book, the oldest written book in the Bible. The oldest written book in the Bible, written in the time of Judges. Here he is. He's going through all this trauma. And he doesn't understand where this trauma is coming from. He just knows that the trauma's there and he's got to deal with it. Some of y'all here today <laughs> don't realize that, that you're not sure where this trauma's coming from. But I can promise you, until you deal with it, you got to ingest it. And then you got to trust God. And now, later, God now invests back. In the <laughs> so the first thing he did, and we're going, to, and then we're going right into the next of this week. Don't tell God you have a big problem. Tell your problem you got a big God. Amen. Don't make you feel a hot pepper. You can say that. So first off, you got to reconnect to God. The very first thing he did was he worshipped. And the Bible said Job got to his feet. He ripped his robe, <laughs> his head, then he fell to the ground and worshipped. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I returned to the womb of the earth. God gives, God takes, God's name ever be blessed. <laughs> what he did, he got up. In other words, he refused to waller in his pain. Not only did he get up, he ripped his, he ripped his robe and shaved his head. He got beyond himself. <laughs> and he turned around and he worshiped. He got in a position to receive. So now, that's the first thing he did. Now, if you're here today, <laughs> you find yourself going through something that's very hard to swallow. You find yourself going through some pain, going through some trauma that you don't quite understand. Satan would love for you to blame God. Satan would love to tell you just how bad you are. And you are receiving what you deserve. Let me tell you. A lot of trauma that we have and that we receive, we don't deserve. But God in all of it is there to help us through it and help us to get, get through all this. The first thing that Job did was he reconnected to God. Number two, look at those guys. He found a support base. Those guys didn't look like much support, did they? He was visited by so-called comforters. Now, in the very beginning, they did okay. Alright? The so-called supporters, they were not very good support. First, they sat with him for seven days and just stared at him. They sat with him. They didn't really do anything. They just sat there for seven days. Up to this point, for the first seven days, these guys did okay. Because sometimes when you're with somebody, and they're going through trauma, they're going through pain, they're going through hurt. You want to have an answer. Or you want them to feel better quick because it hurts you that they're hurting. So you're going to say the almighty, craziest line of all. It's going to be okay.
When you're talking to somebody that's lost a child, when you're talking to somebody that's lost a spouse, when you're talking to somebody that's lost their job, when you're talking to somebody that's lived all kinds of trauma, and you walk up, and you just go, it'll be okay. Really? Really? Please don't say that to anybody. Okay? If you don't say anything, it'll be okay. The best thing you do with somebody who's going through trauma, especially when you don't have all the answers, is just be there. Those comforters didn't give for the first seven days because they kept their mouth shut. They didn't know what to say, or they may have known what to say, but they didn't want to say it, so they kept their mouth shut. So as long as they kept their mouth shut, they ministered to Job in a powerful way. It's called the ministry of presence. There's been many a time as a chaplain, as a pastor, as a father, as a, as a friend of the community, just being there as a spouse, just being there. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know everything. Just being there and holding that person has got an amazing healing power to it. But these guys here, they were doing good until they opened their mouth. When they opened their mouth, they began to blame him. It's your fault, Job, because you were so full of sin. It's your, job, your fault, Job, because if you had to live better, it wouldn't have happened. It's your fault, Job, because God wants to make an example of you because you thought you were all that in a bag of chips, and you're not there. Wow. What comfort. Do me a favor. If you ever see me like Job sitting in a pile of ashes, don't come up and tell me I'm nothing, nobody, and I'm going to sit in that ashes because I blew it. Okay? Matter of fact, I'm asking God to give people holy duct tape on their mouth. Just sit there and be like they were the first seven days and just be there. All right. So then, there's a little part about this. Job was the most mighty man in the land. Job had more than anybody. Job was blessed beyond blessed. It was a very powerful, powerful, powerful life that he lived. He loved God. He is evil. God loved him because he was so close to God. These three comforters come, and it's almost like they couldn't wait to find a flaw to pick with him and say what he was going through, what he was going through. What I have decided, and what I've learned over the years, and been trained, a lot of times, listen carefully, our judgment of others can be a denial of the possibility that we could go through the same thing. You have to be careful when somebody's hurt how you come up and try to help them. Because when you start this, guess what you do? You set yourself in motion to receive it back. That's not fun, is it? God's got a way of fixing things. We just keep our hands off and God will take care of it. Now, now, there's a difference in lifting up and beating up. When somebody's hurt, they're going through trauma, they're, 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 some people just want to feel anything. That's just need to feel something. And you go and sit and lift them up, beat them up, it's not going to be good for either one of you. You see, I love what Romans 15 and 1 says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmity of the weak and not to please ourselves. That every one of us please his neighbor for his good edification. And, and, and I really love the message version of this. Those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who falter. And not just do what is convenient for us. Strength for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? Wow. I promise you, you may be the strong one today. But all it takes is one phone call, one accident, one, one, one car wreck, one layoff, one death, and all of a sudden, you are not the strong one anymore. You are the weak one. And I pray God sends a strong one to help you when you're going through. Galatians 6 and 1 and 2 says, Brother, if a man be overtaken in a fall, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, 
considering ourselves, at least I be tempted. Bear you one of those burdens as though fulfill the law of Christ. Again, I just, I just love that message version. Live creatively, live creatively, friends. If someone falls into sin, forgivingly restore him, saving your critical comments for yourself. You might, you might be needing forgiveness before this day's out. Stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed, share their burdens, and so complete the law of Christ. And if you think you were too good for that, you were badly deceived. So, here's these guys. They've come, and they're beating them up left, right, left, right, right hook, left hook, or left, left jab, a uh, 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 right jab. They're just hitting him and hitting him and hitting him and telling him how bad he is. He's already hurt and saved. He's already, he's already invested so much. And then he just spreads out when he sends his friends. Because when the friends come, Satan really beats up Job. Let me show you something. There's a difference. I can't hear I can see it. There's a difference in pity, sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Pity is to acknowledge somebody's suffering. Sympathy is I care about your suffering. Your suffering. Empathy is I feel your suffering. Compassion is I want to relieve your suffering. When God looked down on man and said, man needs a savior, there was pity. When he sent Jesus to earth, it was sympathy. When Jesus went to the cross, it was empathy. When Jesus rose again so that we could rise with him, it was compassion. Some of y'all here been through some of the toughest things, tough things, tough losses, and through some tough trials. And you wonder, is there any way whatsoever God can get some good out of that? And I'm going to explain that in just a minute. But know this. Until I lost my mother, all I had was pity and sympathy. But after I lost my mother and somebody lost their mother, now I have empathy and compassion. Until I lost my daughter, I had pity and sympathy. But now I lost my daughter, I got empathy and compassion. Think about it. When these things happen to you, God can use you in a very powerful way to relieve other people's stress and relieve and help them in their trauma. So don't think that you're helpless. Remember this, you're a very, very, the more you've been through, the more life has made you a very powerful, powerful person. So now next, sometimes you just have to bow your head, say a prayer, and weather a storm. Wow. Get ready. Trust God when you don't understand. Job didn't understand. He had no idea. But he kept on trusting God. He even argued with God. But he still trusted him. So now, let's, let's, let's just watch this now. Watch, watch, watch. With peace, what peace we would have if we truly believed that God will work things out for his purpose and in his time. Romans 8, 28, it's a go-to scripture. We all go to it, but you know what? Sometimes I think we go to it as a quick pull-out to give to somebody else, but when we're going through it, maybe not so quick to pull it out. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know that all things work together for good and them that love God, but them who are called according to His purpose. We know that all things work together. Did not say that all things were good. I've had a lot of things happen in my life that were not good. But I can promise you, God took the good, the bad, and the ugly and put it together and made something beautiful out of it. I don't know how many remember this, if you were here then, but one Sunday I came in here, and I said, how many like sugar cookies? Everybody's handing it up. And I said, I got some. And I had a big old bag, and I walked down the aisle and said, who wants a sugar cookie? Raise your hand. He was going to raise their hand, and I would throw a plastic bag. I was throwing out ingredients. <laughs> I threw out flour and one person said, I can't eat this. And I threw out sugar and another said, well, I can. I threw out bacon powder to another. I threw out vanilla flavor to somebody. I threw out an egg to somebody. I'm glad they caught it. <laughs> and I said, well, go ahead and eat. There's sugar cookies. Eat them. And people said, we can't eat ingredients. I said, okay, and I took the basket and I said, give it to me. Y'all gave it to me, put it in the basket. I had an easy bake oven up here. I put a, just put, put an apron on. I think I had a hat. And I 
took all the ingredients and I put it in a bowl and I stirred it up and I stuck it in that oven and I turned on the timer and by the timer was on I was preaching when the timer went off of course they didn't know that I actually had gone and bought some gourmet sugar cookies and so I reached in the oven I pulled out the gourmet already good sugar cookies And I read, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. This is the day that the Lord has made. That word made is recipe. This is the day that the Lord has taken everything in your life and put it in a recipe. And I'm going to be glad and rejoice because God took everything and put it together. Romans 8, 28. And he's taken all the things I've gone through, all the good, the bad, the ugly, the sweet, the sour, all those ingredients, those sugar cookies, you saw that stuff you couldn't eat, some of that stuff you wouldn't want to eat. When it's all put together, it made something very awesome. All the things y'all been through. There's hurt, there's pain, there's trauma, there's stress, there's pressure. And you wonder, why in the world would God allow me to go through this? That I don't have, I do not know. I do not know. One thing I do know, the promise is that God is going to work it all out in the end for good. It says, uh, uh, that's why we can be sure that every detail, this is Romans 8, 28, another version. That's why we can be sure that every detail in our lives uh, uh, are going to work, and that our lives of love for God is working to something good. Uh, this is one of my favorites of all time. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And again, another verse, I love this. I love it. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future that you hoped for. When you're down to nothing, you can believe something. God's up to something. When you cannot see His hand, you can trust His heart. Think about it. God's got you like you never could imagine. He loves you more than you ever could imagine. I can't. I remember when, when my first child was born. When I first of all got married, I didn't think I could love anybody like I loved my wife when I first got married. Until I had my first son. And I said, man, how can you love any more than this first son? And when I had my second child, I was thinking, I don't know if I can love this child as much as I love this child because there's no way. And I had my second child, and I found out, wow, I, there, there's a different kind of love for each of them. I can't think of anything I love anymore. And if you think about that, and think about God's love, how much He loves you, that He sent His only Son to die in your place. That's powerful. He loves you that much. I promise you, I love y'all guys, but I can't sacrifice my children for you. I can't. No, we can sit there and try to be big and bad. I can send my son. No, you wouldn't. But Jesus came. Because God <coughs> So, when you can't understand, still trust him. I love this. If you don't know my pain, you'll never understand my praise. Learn from what you experience. God, through all this suffering, revealed himself to Job. Job came to know God better through all the things he went through. Matter of fact, what I found out is God whispers in your pleasure. But he shouts in your pain. God sees. God knows. He understands. The Lord danced and jumped out of the whirlwind. When you're in your whirlwind, I promise God's going to hear. You see, Job got into a position. He got himself in a position to hear. And when he heard, he repented and began to see God in a new light. He says, go back, go back. I had only heard about you before. Listen. Before he went through all this. He said, I had only heard about you before. But now I have seen you with my own eyes. 
I take back everything I said. I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Wow. I never knew God like I knew God when I'm going through something. It's very, very powerful. So learn from your experience, but also you begin to heal when you let go of your past hurts. Forgive those who have wronged you and learn to forgive <laughs> yourself for your mistakes. Learn to forgive others. You don't know how to turn loose. We drag stuff around and drag stuff around and drag stuff around for years. If you hold on to those hurt feelings, it only will get worse. But Joe's situation turned around when? There's two parts. Number one, God's timing. Just the other day, I was watching TVN or something. I heard one of those David Payne with Blab It, Grab It preachers. <clears throat> when he got to talk, he thought that God was up in heaven. Like this. Going. Uh, and would you like fries for that? What did you want? When do you want it? How you want it? I'll have it delivered right to you. That's not how God works. God is not a cosmic sugar daddy, and God is not a bellboy, and God is not somebody walking around up in heaven just trying to find ways to, to alleviate and be there and do whatever we want, whatever we want. Any child I've seen like that winds up being a spoiled child. And they have a hard life. Trust God's time. God knows when you've had enough. God knows you can't take any more. One of the most misunderstood and most, most misquoted scriptures of all times is, is it's not even a scripture, is God, they say, you know, the Bible says God will put more on you than you can handle. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible never says that. If God gave you nothing, God, if God gave you no more than you could handle, then you wouldn't need Him. You could handle. God continuously puts me in positions that I can't handle. Because He wants me to trust Him and to hold on to Him. And to tug on the grace rope. And to hold on. And to know that He's got me. Today, you have yourself over your head and you can't understand it. You're saying, well, God, I thought that you weren't going to allow any more to happen to me that I could that I could handle. And God said, I never said that. I put you there because I want you to trust me. I'm letting this happen because I want you to talk to me. I want you to hold my hand. First, God's timing. When it's right, nobody can stop it. Number two, not only God's timing, but Job's trust. Job realized what was going on. And when God said, when he's talking to Job, Job says, you don't understand it. My pain, my pain is worse than what I'm even saying. My, my pain is worse than my complaint. What I'm going through, I can't even, I can't even verbalize what I'm going through, God. You let me down. And God spoke in a whirlwind and said, where were you when I created the worlds? Where were you when I put everything together? Where were you, Job, when all these things were going down? I know what I'm doing, Job. And when Job began to trust God, in spite of not understanding it, things started happening. His situation turned around after Job. He said, I want you to pray for them old three not here the friends of yours. But Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before, Job 42 and 10. Now, learn to forgive others. <laughs> and expect to turn around. This story starts so badly, but it ends with such an awesome recovery. Job 42, 12 to 15 says, So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. For now he had double 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 team of oxen, 1,000 team of donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three daughters. Stop right there. Job had seven sons and three daughters. They died all at once. House collapsed on him. 
lost all of his animals, and God gave him back double all the animals. Double. Double everything. Except he only gave him seven sons and three daughters. Now that why would he he's giving back double everything but only giving him back the same amount of children that he lost? What is all this about? What you think about something? All the other stuff was material. You can't take that to heaven. I love that Acadia out there. That thing is awesome. Y'all were so awesome to give me that Acadia. I'm telling you, every time I get in, I, I ask God to bless y'all just pour it on me. But you know what? That Acadia ain't going to heaven with me. I know one man that's so tired. I told him, I said, well, they, honestly, I told the man, I said, he's in my family. I said, when you die, they're going to get a big old crane and take a big old hole and put your house, your car, and you, and everything you own in that hole. Because you're so scared and so tight that you're going to have to lose something. And I always say, God, please don't let it be that way. It's just material. It's material things. But he gave him back double material things that he lost. But he only gave him seven sons and three daughters. Why? Because they're not material. They're eternal. Once you get a little, once you are conceived, and when you're born, you may be a physical body, but you are a spiritual being living a physical experience. Because you will live forever. One place or the other, you're going to live forever. And so God gave him back double all the material stuff that he's going to leave down there anyway. But he gave seven sons and three daughters because when he gets to heaven and brings those seven sons and three daughters in heaven, he's got those that died before the trauma and those that were born after the trauma. When he gets to heaven, he's got double. Forever. Wow. That's awesome. God knows what he's doing. We gotta trust him. God's got this. And it's also so very powerful. He named he had, look, he said he named the first daughter Jemima, the second daughter uh, Kezia, and the third Karen Haypuck. In all the land no women were as lovely as the daughters of Job, and their and their father put them into his will along with their brothers. Now, now, now let me show you something here. We're going to talk to you just a minute. This was written on a wall in a work camp in Nazi Germany. This was written by one of the Jews that died of starvation and other work in the prison camps. But they wrote this up on the wall, and I'm pretty sure that they repeated it all the time. And it was, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I'm alone. I believe in God, even when he's silent. Wow. Job got done before his trouble. This is this. He named his daughters according to his healing process. Okay? Once you listen, this is his healing process. Because remember, he lost everything, including his children. Just him and his wife. That's it. That's all he had left was him and his wife. And his body was ravaged, but his body healed. So as God began to build him back, the name of his daughters shows the healing process. The first, Jemima means day by day, and dove, peace. Cassia means cassia, spice, perfume. Karen Haybuck means makeup, or to make beautiful. So Job didn't heal overnight. Some of y'all think, well, I just need to be, look, just need to get better. No, no, no. That's another thing you don't need to say. Number one is, everything's going to be all right. <coughs> no. And this thing is, oh, go ahead and heal. Really? 
Get ready. The process didn't happen overnight. But here it goes. Day by day, God gave him peace. Jemima. He began to spice his life up again. Kezia. Cassia. Spice. Perfume. Life began to get a sweet aroma again. And then God made something beautiful out of all of it. Again. Karen Haymark. Makeup to make you. Wow. God healed this man in a very powerful, powerful way. God spoke to him out of the world again. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. Do you feel like your life's in that now? You're in a whirlwind. You're spinning. You can't seem to get a steady foot. Every time you think something's going to work, it doesn't work. Every time you think something is going to get better, it gets worse. You, you think that you got to handle on things, now you lose the handle on things, and you're just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. Two things I've discovered about storms. <laughs> We wouldn't blame the devil for everything. Not all storms have come to disrupt your life. But some storms come to clear a path. Wow. Y'all can say wow. Yeah. So sometimes you're thinking, I'm not going to survive this, God. I realize <laughs> that the whirlwind you're in is your actual the potter's wheel, and the potter is turning you, and the potter is knocking off the stuff that he doesn't want in your life. He's knocking off the stuff that's, that, 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 that is preventing you from being all you can be for God. And you're in that wheel, and you're spinning, and you're spinning, and you're spinning, and you want to go, what's going on? And God says, trust me. But it don't feel good. And God says, I'm more concerned about your character than your comfort. So the first thing, not all storms come to disrupt your life. Some come to clear a path. And I believe I'm going to put that in mighty army this morning. You see, I, I, I planned on it anyway. And I, I'm getting so, so out of mind sometimes. There it is. Mighty army this morning. Not all storms come to disrupt your life, but to clear your path. This is improve your vision, clear obstacles that held you back. That's my army this morning. And if you don't get my army, let me know. I can put you on this street once a day, 707. The second thing I learned about storms. God knows all you've been through. He's going to make sure you receive double before you trouble. Wow. Hard to believe <laughs> when you're in the middle of the whirlwind, when you're spinning, you're dizzy, you can't keep your breath, you're trying to figure this out, it's hitting you left and right. And you have no idea what's going on. It's hard to even believe that it's going to get better one day. And it's going to, the sun's going to shine again. And you're going to feel God's presence and His power in a very, very powerful way. I talked to someone that long ago. I was with this person when they went through a tragedy in their life. I had no idea what to say, but I was there. And I just waited and stayed there and was with the person. 
And as God began to open up my mind and heart, I was speaking to this person's life. This same person, while in so much pain, wound up changing course in their life and going in a totally different direction. They had no idea that all the stuff before was not by it stopping was not a stop sign. It was not even a speed bump. But it was a catapult. And it was getting ready when all that tragedy happened. It was getting ready to catapult that person into another arena that the person now flourishes in like you wouldn't believe. I very seldom even hear about the pain. All I hear about is what's going on now. And how they thank God for the catapult. Today, right now, I, I have no idea what everybody's going through. But I know this. There's not a person in here that's not going through something. Individually and collectively, we're going through things. And just like Job, some things are totally power, powerless to do anything about. We've got to wait on God. And it's in that waiting that God is building us. And we don't even understand it. We don't see it. But God is doing something special in our lives. Brandy, if you come here, start playing something soft and grow. I tell guys in the V5 all the time, they tell me things like, God can never use me now. Look at where I'm at. I'm in here with drug charges. I'm in here with violence charges. I'm in here for thieving. And I'm in here for whatever. And God can never use me again. And I tell them all the time, this is not that. This is where you're at here in that detention center. It's not a stop sign. It's a speed bump. It slows you down. Gets your attention. And read the race. Some of those guys now who thought life was over now ministers in four or five states of what happened and how God turned them around, how God changed them. Some of them now are going to business. It's amazing what God did when they realized it's not a stop sign, just a speed run. Some of y'all on here today, there's no stop signs. There's speed bumps and catapults. I don't know which one you're on. But if you're on a catapult, if you're on a speed bump, slow down. If you're on a catapult, hold on, baby, we're going for a ride.
here today. You may have heard that in your mind more than once. It's over. That's it. It's over. It's not. Everybody back here. Close your eyes and look around. Job. Day by day, God gave him his peace back. Day by day, God began to spice up his life and smell sweet aromas again. Day by day, God made something beautiful out of his life. And he saw generation after generation come after him before he went to be with God. And he was a blessed, blessed man. If you're here today, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, and just like Job, you've done everything you're supposed to. You've crossed every T, you've dotted every I, you've lived accordingly, and life still sucker punched you. You watch the people that don't even serve God prosper, 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 and you're just here. Brought down. Every time you get back up on one knee, you get knocked down to the other knee. Life is so tough. I promise you, God's watching. And just like Job, day by day, God's going to bring you peace. Day by day, He's going to add flavor and sweet aroma to your life. Day by day, He's going to make your life beautiful again. If you're here today and you're beginning to feel or you felt like it's over, done too much, been too far, gone too far, too much has happened, it's over, and I'm just existing as I'm waiting to die. If I'm talking to you, every head bowed up, I look around. I'm not going to make an example out of you. I just wanted to see who you are so I can pray for you. And I'm talking to you right now. You feel like life, as you know it, is over. And you're just floating along. But you raise that hand. Raise that hand and say, that's me. I need God to show me purpose in you. Maybe you're in the middle of the whirlwind and you're dizzy. You're so dizzy from all the stuff going around. It makes you sick in your stomach. And you're wondering, are you ever going to get off this ride? It's coming to a stop soon. You may not understand at the moment, but you will see later on. Have you ever seen God's faithfulness? He's got it all worked out. He knows what he's doing. Jeremiah 29, 11. He knows what he's doing. He's got it all worked out. He's going to take care of you. He's got a way of taking care of you. You've got to trust him. Psalm 139. He saw every day of your life. Wrote it down in the book before you were ever born. God knows what he's doing. If you're here right now and you're saying, I just, I, I just need some of that peace. I need some of that perfume. I need some of that beauty. Would you nobody look around? Would you put that hand up? I really just need God to show me something. Bless the Lord. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Today, Mark, today is a turnaround day for many people in here. Today, peace is going to start flowing again. Sweet aroma is going to start again. beauty in your life is going to happen again. <coughs> you got to trust me. Let's all pray together. Lord, Lord, I rededicate, I rededicate my, life to you. my life to you. I don't understand, I don't understand things, I go things I go through. I don't like, I don't like everything, that happens, everything that happens. But I know, but I know you're still you're still God. God. And you're still in control. You're still in control. And you could have stopped it. And you could have stopped it. But instead, instead, 
You decided to use it for somebody's good. I thank you, God, for making me a powerful person because of what I've been through. And I thank you, God, for what you're about to do. That it's not a stop sign, but a speed bump or a catapult. And I thank you for it. In all things, I will trust you. I will trust you. Everybody say it. Amen. 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 <laughs> now we're going to say the Lord's prayer as we end, and I'm going to ask Eddie to dismiss us in prayer after we say the Lord's prayer. Ready? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and we give us our trespasses, and we forgive our debts. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've given us. Father, we ask for your anointing in our lives, our daily lives. We ask for your providence in area, every area where it's needed. Go with us, guard, guide, and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen.